Welcome to MHM Podcast Network on MovieHouseMemories.com. Podcast for pod people. Our feature presentation begins now. You're listening to Lunchtime Movie Review from LunchtimeMovieReview.com. And we are the children of the 80s. The Children of the 80s are back with another review of one of our childhood favorite films. I am Patrick. I am Chris. Oh, wait. No, not I'm Chad. Oh, you you ruined it. I was going to say I was Chad, but I'm I'm Chris. I'm Chad. I'm Bond. James Bond. Whoops. (laughs) Wrong podcast. I'm Shane. (laughs) And I'm surprised not one of you just screamed con. (laughs) Shane's in charge of that randomly throughout today's podcast. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. All right. And this week we are reviewing the classic 1982 film, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, for its 40th anniversary of the film. But before we get into our review of this classic 80s film, first, a word from our sponsor. Today's podcast is brought to you by McCoy's All-Purpose Intergalactic Tweezers. Friends, do you have a few hairs you need to pluck from your eyebrows? Do you have a splinter that dug itself into your little toe? Have you recently traveled to SETI Alpha 5 and a screaming madman shoved alien earwigs down your ear canal in order to control you and take over your ship in a frantic bid to escape his horrid exile? Well then, McCoy's all-purpose intergalactic tweezers are for you. Made from transparent aluminum, our powerful pincers will nab your unwanted objects before they know what hit them. Remember, that's McCoy's all-purpose intergalactic tweezers will make you feel like a doctor. All right, and Chris, do you have the summary for this film? I do. I'm going to do a short one. Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan begins with Admiral James T. Kirk. Duh. Duh. He's an instructor at Starfleet Academy, but he hates his desk job. And on his birthday, Bones recommends they go get some adventure in life instead of just riding away. They dial up Vantage or whatever the hell he's uh, selling these days and book a trip on a two-week cadet cruise aboard the USS Enterprise. There, the ship receives a distress call from Regula 1. Kirk assumes the command of his old ship. Yay. The team learns Kirk's old TV nemesis, Con Shoogie Boogie Knight, has resurfaced after years of exile on a hostile planet. Now Khan blames Kirk for his wife's death, and he wants revenge. After Khan learns about Project Genesis, he calls his little friend Tattoo up, and they uh, are going to capture this device. Uh, Kirk's ex-lover and their son leads that doomed project's team, and that doubles Kirk's urgency to save the day before he loses someone he dearly cares about in this Star Trek classic. Shane, scream the name for us. Come on. The end. It's hard to hear the words con over his strong Australian accent. It just doesn't play the same. (laughs) Well, not Latin um, like Ricardo, but... uh... (laughs) It's true. (laughs) All right, Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan was released on June 4th, 1982, the same day as Hanky Panky, Poltergeist, and the re-release of Bambi, uh, the same month as E.T. The Extraterrestrial, Grease 2, Firefox, Blade Runner, The Thing, Annie, and Chad's all-time favorite film with his all-time favorite action hero from the 80s, Ace Hunter in Megaforce. Deeds, uh, not words. Wow. I was that one once. <laughs> it grossed in its times uh, just shy of $79 million at the box office. Uh, a translation today would be about $214 million at the box office. 
It was the eighth highest grossing film of 1982, right behind An Officer and a Gentleman, Rocky Three and Porky's, and right in front of 48 Hours, Poltergeist, and The Best Little Whorehouse in Texas. All films that we've reviewed. Uh, it was the seventh highest grossing film of the Star Trek series, third highest grossing film of the Shatner films. Uh, at Rotten Tomatoes has it at 86% critics and 90% audience. And that is the numbers on Star Trek 2. All right. I know Do you know th- what the uh, number one was for the Shatner Star Treks? Uh, the Voyage Home, Star Trek 4, the whale oh. one. And then it was wow. followed by the motion picture, the first one. Oh. Really? I'm, I'm surprised this one wasn't higher, to be honest with you. But those two I could see doing well. Yeah. Have we ever thought about just calling this the 1982 podcast? <laughs> well, we it used to. Year. Yeah. Well, no, it was a good year. You, we we used to do a lot of films from '84. We used to call that the the probably the best year for films in the '80s. But we did a podcast, uh, Hindsight, years and years ago, talking about the summer. Uh, we talked about June 1982 specifically as one of the best months of all time because you had Blade Runner, you had Thing, you had E.T., you had uh, Star Trek II, you had Poltergeist. Um, what else did you have? Of course, uh, who could forget Megaforce? Um, <laughs> and and you had coming into from May, I think you still had like Conan the Barbarian, which was just a few weeks before. And, and, and there was a lot of films that came out in the summer of 82 that were really good. Yeah. But speaking of the summer of 82, how many of you guys saw this in the theater when it was initially released? Chad. Yeah, I vaguely remember it, but I know I was there to see it only because I remember walking out of the movie theater crying because of the end of this movie. Spoiler alert, uh, when Mr. Spock died, I just lost it. And uh, that's the one thing I remember most about this. Oh, and the earwigs. But yeah, that, <laughs> those are two things that stuck out the most. How, but how, I was definitely there. How old were you when the, when this came out? I would have been, let's see, uh, six going on seven. Okay, so you were younger than I, I was. Ten when I saw this film, I, I did not. I was surprised that he died, uh, but I did not walk out crying. But it was. Yeah, I definitely did because I was not a Star Trek fan. I was all over Star Wars, but I knew of Star Trek. Um, but yeah, I just never expected uh, a character like him to pass away, and more importantly, to basically kill himself in the process. Chris. That's where they stole Iron Man's idea from, wasn't it? Ah, <laughs> uh, you know I can't remember if I saw this in the theater or the drive-in. I'm not sure which one was, but I definitely saw it when it came out. And then, of course, it was on the HBO loop for who knows how many months, and I saw it time and time again. Uh, so it it's in it's just burned into my memory <laughs> at this point. But I'm pretty sure it, it was the drive-in actually that I saw it. Shane. Yeah, like Chad, I saw it as a kid in the cinema with my dad, and I remember the most the earwig thing because it would have freaked me out at the time. And um, Kirstie Alley remembered her very well. Yeah, Pro- probably one of uh, to be honest with you, as far as attractiveness, I think this is one of the roles that she's the most attractive, even with pointed ears. I'm surprised she never t- returned. Like it's such a popular and significant character for this ro- for this movie. She has so much to do in it right from the start. Um, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm not a Trekkie, but, you know, she did her character ever appear in any other movies or comics or shows? No, she was the third movie. Her, the character's in the third movie. Yeah. Okay. I don't, I'm more of a Star Wars person than Star Trek, but um, this one was always my favorite. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I, I distinctly remember seeing this in the theaters. Uh, I saw it a couple times in the summer of 82, uh, because uh, I know I saw it with my mother, and then I think I went back and saw it with my dad because my dad was a Star Trek fan. Um, we may have even seen it at a drive-in. I don't know if it was like the the lead show, but or the second show. And then, as Chris said, the HBO loop. This came on, and it was on all the time. And I wa- I watched it so so many times. It, I'm it's... pretty sure that was my babysitter for the summer of '83. <laughs> it, it, it could have been uh, yours and mine <laughs> both. You know, you know, it's funny. Distinctively, I remember. You know, my dad introduced me to Star Trek after Star Wars in the 70s, the television show. And then, of course, the movie Star Trek, the motion picture came out. And I liked Star Trek, 
but I wouldn't say I was a fan of Star Trek. I became a fan of Star Trek with this film. This film, I was it was much more exciting and energetic than the pre than the motion picture. And although I, I always wondered why they changed their uniforms, because <laughs> I was so used to the uniforms from the show, uh, that uh, this is what made me a Star Trek fan going forward in life. This is this is what finally caught my interest and made me excited to see future films. But they're really good costumes, actually. Like, impressive. Th- in this film or the show? Yeah. No, the uh, movie. Yeah. They were I, different. They were good. No, I, I, I like them much better than the costumes in the motion picture, but I was so used to the colors of the yep. show. That was, I mean, as a kid, that's what I liked. Now, as an adult, I go, yeah, no, I like the more militaristic uniforms and not such the, the cartoon character uniforms, if you will. <laughs> the Wiggles. Yeah. Now, you guys have, two of you brought up the earwigs or whatever the hell those things are as being traumatic for you. I mean, did it really bother you that much? Because I, I blurred by that. Didn't, didn't, didn't bother me in the slightest when I saw this film. Ch- or Shane, I'll start with you. Yeah, I can't speak for chat, but I mean, yeah, but as a kid, I was like freaked out by them. And I was pretty sheltered from horror films, I guess, at that age. So that particular scene when it came out of Chekhov's ear going in wasn't as bad because it sort of slipped in like a slug but when it came out it came out with ooze and blood and it was all traumatic so yeah I remember that distinctly freaking me out a bit yeah and I'm the polar opposite uh when I watched it I remember just the process of not knowing what was in that container and Khan pulling the earwigs out with the tweezers and dropping them in the helmet and then placing their helmets back on. And you're like, okay, where, what, what is, what's going to happen? Even though he explains it at a six years old, I didn't know what he was talking about. I didn't know what the cerebral cortex was. So, you know, <laughs> so to watch that process as a little kid and the earwig, you know, going up their face and into their ear, it's like, Oh shit, is something going to happen to me as a spider? anything going to crawl in my ear and wrap itself around a cerebral cortex, even though I don't know what a cerebral cortex is, but no, that freaked me out when I was a little kid and I was always worried about getting something in my ear. Chris, did it bother you at all? No, it it was memorable uh, because that's not something I had seen in a film uh, at that time, but you know, this was the year poltergeist and the thing. So I had also seen those and those were, more spooky than this and in fact i think uh if i remember correctly i, I kind of thought the effect of it coming out was a little hokey oh really i no, i thought it was a great effect going in and going out <laughs> didn't have a problem with that um and i thought it was a great plot point i you know it as a kid i you know was that you can mind control someone just by that that was pretty effective you know now as an adult i go well it makes them susceptible to suggestion, but wouldn't that be anybody suggesting anything to them? <laughs> so it would yeah. be, you could just, you know, overcome that suggestion by saying, Hey, go do this. But Well, Paul Win- Winfield's character, uh, Terrell, I think it was, or Terrell, he killed himself to, to finish it off. So he had enough control to commit suicide. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and and that was his hero way out, it, it, not to give up on his morals and his beliefs in Starfleet to to hurt, not to hurt an innocent person, and rather take his own life. Chekhov mm. just you know just fainted, and then got lucky that it crawled out. <laughs> what a drama queen! Now, you know this had been this is made three years after the motion picture. Uh, which I still think is an ironic title for the film because there's not really a lot of motion uh, going on in that film. It's pretty stagnant. (laughs) And I was surprised when this came out because this is very much, you know, a a kind of action suspense because you never get the full-blown like fist fights that you would expect from a a confrontation with Kirk. Um, But the, this uh, almost like submarine battle between these, these two in space uh, you know, what did you guys think of the the film and kind of the, the uh, almost a change in genre for what traditional Star Trek shows were in the uh, the sixties? Well, I think they had to change. I mean, with all of these space films coming out post Star Wars, they had to up their game if they wanted to stay relevant. 
And I, I don't know if there was criticism back in the day of motion picture being a little boring. It, it's more Space Odyssey-esque as opposed to Star Wars and as opposed to Khan, which tends to go to more of a thriller type of film. And I don't know... I don't know why they did it, but it, it works infinitely better than the first one. Well, this was my introduction to Star Trek. Oh, really? I hadn't seen the show before this that I can remember, and I certainly didn't see the original motion picture when it was released. Uh, I still haven't, actually. I still haven't <laughs> seen it in full, the the uh, first one. I've seen all the other uh, Star Trek movies from start to finish, but I actually, for some reason, and I own a copy on Blu-ray too. I've just never sat down and watched it all. Uh, but that said, yeah, no, I, I just know Star Trek from this. This was my beginning, so I had nothing to compare it to. First off, Shane, I'm going to tell you that Star Trek, the motion picture, is literally the cure for insomnia. So uh, <laughs> go ahead and watch it if you can't fall asleep one night. Well, I hear it's influenced by 2001, A Space Odyssey. Yeah. Is this true? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Too much. Well, I love 2001 is one of my all-time favorites top three i thought it was inspired by moonraker is that no, incorrect no 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 <laughs> but i'll sit down and watch it some at some point i think i have a director's cut or extended edition yeah. even Chad, oh, so perfect. maybe i will go to sleep perfect no i love the way they approached the second one um because let's face it, it I, i'm not going to say this is star wars in any way but it i don't ever really remember in the what little of the TV show I had watched up to that point, or even since, where they just have the sp spaceships being the main, uh, the main sets or the main weapons that uh, are used throughout it, and it's cool because you're seeing the quote unquote pirate ships, if you will, fighting against each other, or the warships uh, that you would have had um, throughout history now being used in space, and that theme of them being to equal spaceships, but you have a very knowledgeable uh, captain, I guess, even though he was the admiral, and he's got a young crew. He, he's going against a man who has superior intellect but has no experience, and they're, you're getting to see these ships go and battle with each other, and that was just totally cool because some of the best parts of Star Wars, those movies, is watching the ships battle each other. Uh, even the Death Star and the spaceships battling each other. So I'm glad that they didn't ha even have Khan and Kirk square off as they did in the TV show and go fisticuffs. They had them battle with their intellect and their weapons, if you will. So I thought it was a great change of pace, and especially compared to the first movie. And I, I think they, whoever ultimately made the decision on this w made the correct decision and stuck with it. You know, I agree with you. I know that there was a, a push or there was at least a version of the script at one point in time where Kirk was supposed to battle Khan kind of fisticuffs at the end, very similar to the episode where Khan was introduced in the series. And I think that would have been very jarring and completely unnecessary. Much like Chad said, I like the cerebral nature of it, this chess game in space where they're using their wits and their intellect to battle each other. And I think that was much more effective, obviously relied much more on special effects that, which I really appreciated when I was a kid. Um, and uh, that ultimately is why I think this film uh, succeeds is that it jettisons away how the entire series was, which was a, an element of necessity. The series relied on, okay, now Kirk is going to get in a fight with the bad guy because they couldn't do a lot of special effects. They couldn't do a lot of things. They The series was made on the cheap, so it was easier just for them to get into a fist fight uh, at the end to, to have the ultimate climax that way. And in the films, they had the ability to do so much more. And, and Shane, as much as I bag on the motion picture, it is a very cerebral film. It is not a bad film. It's right. just slow is what it is. And I, I think that they had it. It was overly ambitious and not mm. did not play into the world of it, it it didn't have as much humor as the series did or even this film did it you know it and it was it was a lot of setup to establish where these characters were at and 
and everything was fractured among them. That 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 was right. like bringing the characters back together again and trying to fit them into place. That they it gets kind of bogged down at the beginning of the film, but it's still better than a lot of other science fiction films like battle beyond the stars or some of the other crap that was <laughs> being shit out at the time. But you know, what Star Trek, the motion picture had that a lot of films could use <laughs> is a kick-ass bald chick. <laughs> yeah, no, I'll watch it, Patrick. And I, I, I'm sure I'll like it, even though it is slow, but it's just, I don't know why I've just never gone back to it, but I rarely go back to many Star Star Trek movies and oh. i've never been a, a huge trekkie even the new series of star trek movies i don't mind but i've not really gone back to revisit them yeah it's interesting well why why is that shane i mean would i mean would star you... wars i don't know i just prefer star wars oh, and uh... when it comes to science fiction i like alien and aliens and uh terminator and just stuff like that rather than star trek for some reason Chad, would you consider yourself uh, a trekker or trekkie, however you want to refer to yourself as? No, I really am not. Um, I here's the the reason I even really follow Star Trek is because when I was younger, I stayed with my grandma and grandpa almost every day through the summer, and my grandfather, for whatever reason, would not let me watch TV except unless there was a baseball game on or Star Trek, and he would <laughs> watch Star Trek because he had the sense that most of the things on that show were going to be our future. And I always held that in my heart and because it was my grandfather and I learned he was absolutely right. A lot of the stuff that happened in the TV show came to fruition in terms of technology and all that. So I always followed the movies and I appreciate the movies, but I, I am not a Trekkie. I just am entertained by them. Chris, would you consider yourself a trekkie or a trekker? No, not at all. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I'm a fair weather fan. I, I haven't actually seen any of the, the new films. I pretty much stopped watching it when the Next Generation TV show ended. Um, and not that I dislike any of the new stuff. I, it's just I haven't gotten around to it. Uh, but um, I know the TV series ended in 69, but I feel like throughout the whole 70s, they were on re- they were on reruns the whole time, weren't yeah, they? All the time. Because I swear I saw it all the time on TV. Yes. Yeah. You would think that there were a million episodes of the show, as much as it was on. But it's just four years. Yeah. Three years. It's not. Three years. It's not a great number. It's maybe sixty or seventy episodes. Seventy. It's uh, seventy nine episodes. Seventy nine. Okay. But yeah, it was on all the time when I was very young. So you would thought it was on all the time. And I believe on Me TV. I think that's the channel. Uh, they they're on on Sundays, and I'll every so often I'll I'll watch an episode, and it's looks like they've been redone in high def or at least 1080, and and so they they look good for, I would rather watch old Star Trek than old Batman to be honest, <laughs> and um and so I enjoy watching that. You don't really see the the old Batman on TV reruns anymore. Yeah, the the original series did get a restoration. Uh, I don't know, about 10, 11 years ago, they went back and they actually redid special effects from the show and, you know, and uh, brought it up to probably Blu-ray status. Uh, I don't think they're up to 4K, but uh, they they actually spent the time doing that. And they they did some of that with the early episodes of Next Generation. That's where they stopped. They didn't do any of the other shows. Uh, It's weird because I... I, I wouldn't necessarily call myself a Trekker or a Trekkie, but I've seen the Star Trek films over and over again, with the exception of probably the last one of the most recent, uh, Star Trek Beyond. I think I've seen that twice. And it's not that I didn't like it. I just, I don't think that cast has quite the chemistry as the other casts that came before it. And I haven't enjoyed those films nearly as much. Um, but I, I, grew up watching these you know all the time start as i said i saw star trek 2 and star trek 3 on the hbo loop over and over and over again (laughs) and uh, i enjoyed watching them all the time and i still watch them from time to time now don't i don't revisit one and five very often uh, but i really do like star trek i much like chad said i think the, the 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 themes of Star Trek were pretty optimistic of the original series and potentially next generation. But 
uh, with this kind of hopeful ideas for the future of how things are going to be. Um, you know, I, I think the later series got a little bit more pessimistic, but there, there wasn't as much war, if you will, that they were, they were ambitious about knowledge and experience and helping and, you know, and learning from other species and stuff like that. And it was very, a very, very distinctive, uh, you know, feel to the show that didn't, that you didn't have in other films. And the one thing, one of the things I liked about Star Trek, the show, as well as the movies, is they usually took some element, some theme, some underlying thought, and had a science fiction element, but they were kind of trying to talk about something uh, into, intellectually, uh, whether it was this, the 60s when they'd be talking about racism, but they would be doing it between an alien species. Uh, but in this, the theme of like growing old, uh, because Kirk was 52. That's how old he was. It supposedly turning on his birthday in this film based off the how when we know Kirk was born as, as far as Star Trek lore. I'm like, <laughs> really old? I'm 49. <laughs> and they're treating him like, it's time to go out to pasture, buddy. <laughs> it's like, that's ridiculous. But this, And it's in the future where people live longer yeah, than I would, expected. I yeah. would think so. I mean, uh, McCoy was alive, and McCoy and uh, uh, Spock were alive in the Next Generation era, so <laughs> they lived for a long, long time. But what did you guys kind of think of that? Even though it's not the main point of the film, it's this un- there's this underlining theme of growing old and, and how you react to it. Uh, Chris? Well, you know, it really hadn't occurred to me um, until you mentioned it just now. So I guess it didn't impact me that much, but it, it is, it's pretty silly. Uh, I mean, the, the themes are universal and I guess their target group were the the boomers that were starting to, uh, to get on in age. And so that's really what the target market was at this point, because what were, what were the boomers at this time? late thirties, early forties, maybe some even get into the fifties. So they are Kirk's age. So I get why they would go that route. But, um, but yeah, it, it, that completely went over my head in the film. That went that for you to go over your head. I mean, yeah. that's not subtle. <laughs> they're, yeah. they're hitting you in the face throughout the entire film with like, I feel old. I mean, he literally says, how does that make you feel? I feel old, you know, used up. <laughs> So, yeah. well, I didn't really think of it in terms of, let's say, you know, they're living till 100, 120, 130, because no, you're not old if you're that. You're not even middle aged at that point. But so that's, I guess, where I'm going with that. Shane? Yeah, I'm a bit like Chris. I'm sorry, Patrick, but I didn't really take a lot of notice of it either. Even on this occasion, uh, there was that line from McCoy, you know, that. Kirk should be in the sky and not, you know, you didn't want him to do the, be an admiral and just, he was better suited to just in on the enterprise uh, roaming the galaxy. But I, the whole old thing wasn't really something I, you know, took note of mentally anyway. <laughs> I, I got, I got a few of the jokes, but I didn't sort of think, think much of it. Chad. Well, damn it, Patrick, I hate to tell you you're right, but you're right. Um, <clears throat> Why do you I hate to se- tell me that? I had seven themes written down that I found in this movie. And that was one of my seven themes was the old guard versus the new guard. And basically, Kirk, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Kirk having issues with, you know, walking away from his ship and wanting to be the space pirate or a space captain and having to see new kids come in and replace him and the struggles that he had to do with that. And like I said earlier, you have the theme of intelligence versus experience with Khan versus Kirk, but also it's the same thing with uh, Savick versus Kirk. And that's just, like I said, it was one of those themes that was throughout this movie. And I've guess I've always seen it and I really noticed it this time. So um, yeah, that was just one of the many I wrote down in my notes, but I really appreciated it in this viewing. Unlike my other two cohorts here, who I guess just didn't see it at all. Do you think that uh, Kirk had space herpes at this point in his life? That could have been affecting him. That was a different movie, if I remember right. (laughs) Yes. I didn't see any ice pirates. (laughs) McCoy would have taken care of that for him, Chris. 
<laughs> well, yeah, he is pretty crafty with that uh, that alternate medicine. <laughs> and, and Chad, do you think you notice it more now because you are older? <clears throat> yes, definitely. And I think it's more of a theme that they try to use in a lot more movies and films uh, since I, uh, seeing this as a kid. They try to introduce, you know, like we watch various TV shows where you have – uh, a new version of it constantly coming out. Movies are constantly being reintroduced, but they have older characters from the original series or original films being replaced by newer characters, but yet you see the clashes. And I think this was one of those movies that introduced all that, uh, having a TV show that was from the 60s, now in the 80s, coming in and you're trying to replace the old people with them possibly being replaced with new characters like Savick. Um, so yeah, it's, I think, uh, I see it now more than ever because of experience personally and on, in entertainment venues or avenues. Yeah. And I feel like we need to listen to Roy Clark's yesterday at this point, <laughs> <laughs> reflect on the days gone by. Who's Roy Clark? <laughs> you never oh. watched it all? Never He's watched a great Clark? country Western singer performer. He's passed away. Oh, no, I've never heard of him. Actually, sorry. great uh, guitarist for any genre, I would say. Yes, but, I agree. But uh, anyway, sorry, Patrick, I interrupted you. No, I was I was just going to say that it, it's weird that as a kid, I, I thought the old aspect was played more for comedy, and now it resonates more for, to me now <laughs> as I get older. Just this this idea of, uh, you know, this, this guy who's looking for his place in life, that he's had success – and now he's relegated to his success and, and he's not enjoying it. And he wants to be kind of that as, as, as Chad kind of said, this, you know, this kind of space captain out there having adventures and you know, that it's, it's something that continues to come up for at least a couple more films until he's returned to being a captain, I think in star Trek four. Yeah. The end of star Trek four. Uh, and then, you know, they're, they, they kind of move past that. And when he actually really, really does get old and unbelievable playing that action hero, then they make him go out there and be captain again. Well, you know, it, it's just as recently as this year's recording, he's 90 years old and he just went up into space again. So it never ends for the captain. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's right. And he's he's. This year, he made a movie called Senior Moment, which, if you've seen, is really funny. <laughs> like him oh. and Christopher Lloyd. So he's still doing stuff, going to going to space and acting. Wow, I I have not heard of that. And he's reteaming with Christopher Lloyd from Star Trek Three. So that's there you go. Yeah, yeah, it's just a, it's a comedy, but it's uh, a lot of fun to get a chance to watch it. Uh, anything else you want to talk about this one, Chris? Well, you know, it's interesting to me that in 1965, when Star Trek started, Patrick Stewart was 25 years old and he still did not have any hair. <laughs> Fun factoid. That's all I got. Okay. It, it, it's funny. Years and years ago, uh, I, I took a class with a, a friend of mine and Chris's name, Mike, and we were taking, uh, and it was some, I don't know, anthropology class, but they they were showing this video and it was showing something from some Shakespearean thing. And it's, it's from the sixties and Patrick Stewart is in it and he has a little bit of hair, <laughs> not a lot, but a little bit of hair, but it was, he was so incredibly skinny and it was, we were, both of us were the big nerds in the class and we we're like, it's Captain Picard <laughs> you know, like immediately. But it's, yeah, he's, he was a very much a working actor for many, many years before he had, hit it big. Chad, anything you want to bring up about Star Trek II before we wrap it up? Well, like I mentioned earlier, uh, there's so many themes in this movie that just keep standing out to me, and I think why I always have liked this film. Um, the big one, especially in today's uh, age, is where the the scene with Spock and uh, Captain Kirk and early in the movie, and then it's foreshadowed toward the end when the Kirk passes away. And he talks about the logic dictates that the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, or in this case, the one I always thought was one of the most genius concepts ever brought out in any medium, uh, books, TV, film, 
music, whatever. And in the world we live in today, where so many battles are being fought for whatever reason, I think people need to step back and realize that the needs of the many do outweigh the needs of the few. But we live in a selfish world these days where no one will even stop to think about that. So that's one of the things I always loved about this. And then the also the I always have appreciated the whole concept of the Kobayashi Maru scenario that they go through, which is a true test of character um, that Kirk bypasses to get by. Um, I always thought that was a great thing, trying to go through life and having many no-win situations and how you deal with them and how you examine your character and improve your, improve your character, I thought was a great theme that this brought, uh, movie brought to light, and I've always respected very much out of this film. Shane? Yeah, just to add to what Chad's saying about the elongated finale, I mean, that's an iconic Trekkie moment and still stands the test of time. It's like just amazing, the emotion. And, and I'm not a Trekkie, but it, the acting and just that scene is very is pivotal. Uh, I really enjoyed watching it again. Uh, and the score by James Horner, the late James Horner, I thought that was a top-notch, full marks music in this. Like, it was really good all the way through. Uh, even had a bit of uh, Amazing Grace at the end of it uh, snuck in. The sets were magnificent. I thought the matte paintings, some of those images were just uh, amazing. I mean, uh, the battle scenes in space looked absolutely spectacular. It was a beautiful movie, and I appreciated that. Yeah, you know, you, you bring up something there. First of all, James, one of James Horner's first scores, too. I mean, he was a, a fairly inexperienced uh, composer at that point in time uh, as far as film scores, and I, and I agree with you. It's a, it's a very a great... Uh, soundtrack uh, but the there the the whole and i mean the film is wrapped up about 10 minutes before the film ends i mean the the, yeah. ma the main conflict is over and it's just a sad you know march and funerals procession for spock from the moment kirk comes down into the engineering area and has and he has his conversation as spock dies to his funeral and they have that very, very light moment of levity, at least to end the film with, you know, Kirk saying, I feel young, you know, and, which is once again, going to the theme that I think this entire fucking movie was about that you guys just <laughs> blew by, but is that, you know, that it leaves you with this hopeful trend. And, and it's weird as a kid that I never thought he was dead. And of course we, I was right uh, because they had, Leonard Nimoy do the the sign off uh, saying that you know uh, you know space the final frontier, and I, I and to me that just dictated okay he's he's still there, uh, and that he'll come back and of, and of course he does in the next film but he really did not intend on coming back he was he was done he did not want to do any more Star Trek films and so it was it was interesting that that happened. I was going to just say there's an, an Australian link as well that I can't let go at the beginning or near the beginning towards the uh, the whole earwig horrific moment you have uh, Paul Winfield and, and uh, Chekhov heading into the I think it was the ruins of the USS Botany Bay yeah they find well that is a place in Sydney postcode 2036 Botany Bay is where Captain Cook landed when he discovered Australia and the Aborigines attacked him yep I, I actually I knew that <laughs> and they discussed that in the episode space seed where Khan is introduced originally that he was on botany or part of botany bay and that's where it all came from really see i've not seen that series that this movie is developed from yeah, they about every seventh episode is good and then the <laughs> other six are shit <laughs> but when it's good it's really good when it's shit it's really really bad I, well, in the video shop when I used to work there, obviously, as a teenager, there used to be like two or three episodes of Star Trek on VHS, and people would rent them out all the time. I don't think it was on TV. You're talking about the series on a lot in the 70s, Chris. Well, I'm pretty sure it wasn't here. If it was, it went by me in the, in the 70s and the 80s. So I just remember it being on uh, VHS in like a series of volumes, but it was only like uh, three episodes 
a type. Oh, no, we when I worked at Blockbuster, when I first started working at Blockbuster, when we had unlimited space, um, we had most of the series on video. And then as the years went by, we would sell off because there was, a, as I said, there's a lot of shitty episodes that no one wanted to rent. It's, I can't remember the name of it right now, but there's a hippie episode, at which is a whole bunch of hippies playing music and and it's a it, it's it's just fucking painful to watch but you know like you know the con episode space seed as well as like the trouble with tribbles the city on the edge of forever some of the more popular episodes those uh would get actually get rented and checked out and so over time we'd sell off used copies of the ones that no one watched or rented and then we used to have like four or five of the more popular episodes and i it, i would watch that when we were opening or closing the store, I would often put that in and just listen to it because I enjoyed watching those episodes. All right. Oh, well, let's wrap it up. Uh, do we think the film stands the test of time and would we recommend it for uh, people moving forward into a new generation of Star Trek potentially in a couple of years? Or sorry, Chad. Uh, yeah, I this one more than stands the test of time. This is one of those that uh, I loved it as a kid because I loved adventure movies and Star Wars type movies and Star Trek movies. Um, but now as a mid adult in my mid 40s, this thing is extraordinary. The way it's made is extraordinary. The acting, as much as the Star Trek people are made fun of, the acting is actually very good in this movie. Uh, the pacing, the editing, the directing, everything is really good. This one more than stands the test of time. It's superior to some of the more recent uh, Star Trek movies that were made. It is outstanding, and I recommend it to anybody ever. Yeah, this stands the test of time for sure. This is my favorite of all the Star Trek films I've seen, and uh, it it doesn't get old. I don't really know if they could top this film in my eyes. So, yeah, I, it definitely it, it's it's the best. It is it's also one of the few films that I think exceeds far and away exceeds the original film. So, Shane, yeah, no, I I happily concur with my American friends there. <laughs> uh, yes, indeed, it's the best Star Trek movie, and it stands the test of time, no doubt whatsoever it's rewatchable, and as i said before it's a beautiful film to look at i have it on dvd and it's i'm um, in a blu-ray copy and it says it's director's cut which is the one i re-watched for the podcast and it's only apparently three or four minutes longer i didn't pick up what was different but uh yeah it's a terrific movie i highly recommend it just for science fiction fans in general you don't have to be a trekkie it was three more minutes of uh kirk screaming con that's all it was <laughs> Uh, the three or four, the, the main element that is added to the director's cut is the, uh, Scotty's nephew. There's uh, some additional sequences that that engineer oh, okay. who dies and Scotty starts crying, that's his nephew. And in the, the theatrical version, it's never identified as his nephew. It's just a, a, an engineer that works with him. And so I think the, I actually think the director's cut's a little bit better because it gives some a, emotional resonance of why Sc Scotty starts bawling over that specific, specific engineer. Um, yeah, no, I agree with you. It's, it absolutely stands the test of time. This would be in my top 50 of the 80s films. I, I love this film. Uh, I bounce back and forth between this being my favorite Star Trek film and Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, being the, uh, my favorite film. But this is probably the one I've seen most often, uh, mainly because of that HBO loop. Uh, I, I love the character of Khan. I like everything they did in it. I agree with everything that Shane said. It's a beautifully shot film. It can, considering how much money they spent on the motion picture, they spent a far less on this film. And I think it looks just as good, if not better, especially in the, the Nebula battle. I think that was really it's something you hadn't seen on the, the big screen before in a science fiction film. And I thought it played out very, very well. Um, and it's obviously it's had a lasting impact because J.J. Abrams literally went back and stole from so much of this film for Star Trek Into Darkness. Uh, which was a shitty sequel, <laughs> yeah. and 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 frustrating as well that you couldn't. I, I had no problem with you taking the con character, but couldn't you have done something 
a little bit more unique, a little bit different and not repeat the same story elements, even if you just switch characters over and over, you know, to, to, to hit the same pl- plot points. But yeah, I didn't, I did not enjoy that film quite as much. Uh, but yes, I think it's uh, I highly, it, it is a classic Star Trek film. I would never put it in my top 100 of all time, but I really, really do love watching this movie and I, I would recommend it for anyone, even someone entering into Star Trek. This is a good place to enter into Star Trek, uh, the Star Trek universe, much like Shane did. All right, well, that does it for this month's review of Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. Thanks again for joining us and listening to our little monthly podcast. If you've had a good time, the fun doesn't have to stop here. You can follow us on Pinterest or Twitter at MH Memories. On either one of those social media outlets, you can keep informed about our occasional written film reviews and film summaries, news on upcoming theatrical releases and trailers, and information on many upcoming podcasts on the MHN Podcast Network. Additionally, don't forget to subscribe to our account on YouTube, where we're now releasing our podcasts exclusively. Uh, Once there, if you subscribe to our account, you can get updates as to when we post new material on the website. You can give us a a thumbs up, a thumbs down, or even leave a comment about our opinions or the movie that we're reviewing, or make a suggestion for an 80s film that you would like us to review sometime in the future. Of course, we always like the reviews that are positive, but we appreciate any feedback that we can get from any listeners of the show. Well, that does it for this episode of Lunchtime Movie Review. Until next time, I'm Patrick. I'm Chad, and I have an earwig for anyone who doesn't like this movie. I'm Chris. And I'm Shane. And we got to get out of here right now, and you guys are invited. This podcast is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. The theme song for Lunchtime Movie Review, Fireworks, is brought to you by Alexander Nakarada at SerpentSoundStudios.com under a Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 license. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Lunchtime Movie Review, the MHM Podcast Network, and Fuzzy Bunny Slippers Entertainment, LLC, unless otherwise noted.